Chapter 19 In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt, on that same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they had departed from Rephidim, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, they encamped in the wilderness, and there Israel encamped before the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, This is what you shall tell the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and set before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready against the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. You shall set bounds to the people round about, saying, Be careful that you don't go up onto the mountain, or touch its border. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned, or shot through. Whether it is animal or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mountain. Moses went down from the mountain to the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, Be ready by the third day. Don't have sexual relations with a woman. It happened on the third day when it was morning, that there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of an exceedingly loud trumpet, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lower part of the mountain. Mount Sinai, the whole of it, smoked, because the Lord descended on it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The Lord said to Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Let the priest also who come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth on them. Moses said to the Lord, The people can't come up to Mount Sinai, for you charged us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and sanctify it. The Lord said to him, Go down, and you shall bring Aaron up with you, but don't let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break forth on them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, drew near. The chief priest and the scribes sought how they might put him to death, for they feared the people. Satan entered into Judas, who was surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered with the twelve. He went away and talked with the chief priests and captains about how he might deliver him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He consented and sought an opportunity to deliver him to them in the absence of the multitude. 
the day of unleavened bread came, on which the Passover must be sacrificed. He sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him into the house which he enters. Tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large furnished upper room. Make preparations there. They went, found things as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will no longer by any means eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He received the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you, I will not drink it all again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. Likewise he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. The Son of Man indeed goes, as it has been determined. But woe to that man through whom he is betrayed. They began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. There arose also a contention among them which of them was considered to be greatest. He said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. But one who is the greater among you, let him become as the younger, and one who is governing as one who serves. For who is greater, one who sits at the table or one who serves? Isn't it he who sits at the table? But I am in the midst of you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. I confer on you a kingdom, even as my Father conferred on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. You, when once you have turned again, establish your brothers. He said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will by no means crow today until you deny that you know me three times. He said to them, When I sent you out without purse and wallet and shoes, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now, whoever has a purse, let him take it, and likewise a wallet. Whoever has none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. For I tell you that this which is written must still be fulfilled in me. He was counted with the lawless. For that which concerns me has an end. They said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. He said to them, That is enough. He came out and went as his custom was to the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. When he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that you don't enter into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he rose up from his prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief, and said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas? Do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? A certain one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered, Let me at least do this, 
and he touched his ear and healed him. Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and elders who had come against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you in the temple daily, you didn't stretch out your hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. They seized him and led him away and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed from a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat among them. A certain servant girl saw him as he sat in the light and looking intently at him said, This man also was with him. He denied Jesus, saying, Woman, I don't know him. After a little while someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter answered, Man, I am not. After about one hour passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Truly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you are talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the Lord's word, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows you will deny me three times. He went out and wept bitterly. The men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. Having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? They spoke many other things against him, insulting him. As soon as it was day, the assembly of the elders of the people was gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you won't believe, and if I ask, you will in no way answer me or let me go. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say it, because I am. They said, What do we need any more witnesses? For we ourselves have heard from his own mouth. Chapter 37 Yes, at this my heart trembles, and is moved out of its place. Hear, O oh, hear the noise of his voice, the sound that goes out of his mouth. He sends it forth under the whole sky, and his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it a voice roars, he thunders with the voice of his majesty. He doesn't hold back anything when his voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we can't comprehend. For he says to the snow, Fall on the earth, Likewise to the shower of rain, And to the showers of his mighty rain. He seals up the hand of every man, That all men whom he has made may know it. Then the animals take cover, And remain in their dens. Out of its chamber comes the storm, And cold out of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, And the breath of the waters is frozen. Yes, he loads the thick cloud with moisture. He spreads abroad the cloud of his lightning. It is turned round about by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the surface of the habitable world. Whether it is for correction, or for his land, or for loving kindness, that he causes it to come. Listen to this, Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know how God controls them? and causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know the workings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge, you whose clothing is warm, when the earth is still by reason of the south wind? Can you with him spread out the sky, which is strong as a cast metal mirror? Teach us what we shall tell him, for we can't make our case by reason of darkness. Shall it be told him that I would speak, or should a man wish that he were swallowed up? Now men don't see the light which is bright in the skies, but the wind passes and clears them. Out of the north comes gold and splendor, with God is awesome majesty. We can't reach the Almighty, He is exalted in power, in justice and great righteousness He will not oppress. Therefore men revere Him, He doesn't regard any who are wise of heart.
Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I say this not to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and live together. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I overflow with joy in all our affliction. For even when we had come into Macedonia, our flesh had no relief, but we were afflicted on every side. Fightings were outside. Fear was inside. Nevertheless, he who comforts the lowly, God, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, while he told us of your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For though I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that my letter made you sorry, though just for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you were made sorry to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly way, that you might suffer loss by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, which brings no regret, but the sorrow of the world works death. For behold, this same thing, that you were made sorry in a godly way, what earnest care it worked in you. Yes, what defense, indignation, fear, longing, zeal, and vengeance. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be pure in the matter. So although I wrote to you, I wrote not for his cause that did the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered the wrong, but that your earnest care for us might be revealed in you in the sight of God. Therefore we have been comforted. In our comfort we rejoice the more exceedingly for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him on your behalf, I was not put to shame. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so our glorying also which I made before Titus was found to be truth. His affection is more abundantly toward you, while he remembers all of your obedience, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice that in everything I am of good courage concerning you.